So what in the world is going on with the M1 Thunderbolt speeds? And is this whole USB 4 the same as Thunderbolt 3 when it comes to performance? I have seen some numbers on some forums. I think we need to clear some things up. I've done some testing. So let's go ahead and unpack this one and I'll share with you my testing on the Thunderbolt 3 enclosure, which I've tested before, and also a USB 4 enclosure that I have, but with one really important message when it comes to your buying decision. So stay tuned for that. Got the pencil out, so I'll see you in there. What is going on, you beautiful humans? Welcome back to the channel. And yes, today we're gonna to get a little nerdy together, especially on these M1 Max and what's happening with the ports. So I do actually wanna give a shout out and thanks to eGPU.io for that teardown that they did on the Mac Mini. And it resulted in a little bit more clarification on those Thunderbolt controllers as the JHL 8040R, that's a mouthful, but they were also known as Burnside Bridge. And when we say controllers, in this case, we're actually talking about a retimer, which these are also set up as two dedicated Thunderbolt 3 USB 4 ports. Now, based on my research, that retimer that's placed near the actual port helps clean up that communication between the point of entry into the computer and of course the controller on the die of the chip. Now, in this setup on the die, it's also needing those retimers as close, I mean, as close as possible. So that's actually what they're gonna have to figure out, I think, in future iterations. And when I say they, I mean Apple. They're really gonna have to figure this out because as those demands on the I.O. increases, I really think there are gonna be more issues. So not to get too thick into it here because I think we've already started to do that, but Thunderbolt 4, as it's been tossed around, is really just Thunderbolt 3 that's still 40 gigabits per second but it has more strict requirement on what is actually considered the minimum functionality. Loving using these air quotes. But the latest iteration here from Apple, and you've also heard the term USB 4, which I've personally said to myself, my colleagues and friends, how USB-C is gonna just completely simplify things when it comes to all of our devices. And I'm gonna rescind that statement. I should have never said it. I should know better and that's just how I'm gonna leave it. So this USB 4 is actually a new thing here. And thanks to Apple and that marketing confusion, what we're really hearing and seeing, it seems that it's basically got some sort of modified version of Thunderbolt 3 on the M1 chip specifically. And of course, I will get into that in another video because this modified version seems to really rely on the help of those powered hubs. But Moving back to the controllers themselves, like the actual controllers, we've got DisplayPort up to 1.4. Cool, loving it. USB 3.2 Gen 2. Yep, like that too. However, it seems that the uh, 20 gigabits per second, which is what we should be getting, apparently is optional with Apple. And that's where I'm having issues when it comes to that throughput and even the USB 3.1 Gen 2, where I should be getting 10 gigabits per second as I do on my Intel machine over there. However, Apple seems to be keeping us closer to about five. Thanks, Apple. So with Thunderbolt 3 being up to 40 gigabits per second and then Intel having given this protocol to the USB promoter group and then throwing that USB 4 label on it, and throwing that into the mix, which is supposed to give us the same 40 gigabits per second. But what it is, is that it's also compatible with Thunderbolt 3, which seems obvious. However, it's also compatible with those USB-C devices, which should be good that I keep saying USB-C is just gonna clear things up. Now, of course, I'll discuss the benchmarks because what it comes down to for my previous and really my current use case to truly take full advantage and to saturate that bandwidth. And the previous use was the eGPU, which I used again on my Intel MacBook Pro. But when it comes to these Thunderbolt enclosures and the PCIe SSDs, this is actually where that saturation is helpful. And something that I'm also wanting to experiment with and I'm working with someone on right now are the RAID setups to really take full advantage and to saturate uh, and get that full speed or full throughput. But pivoting over to these enclosures, I still think that the fledging setup is awesome. And the controller in that is the Alpine Ridge, which this is exclusive to Thunderbolt 3. Whereas with the Acasis USB 4, this enclosure has the Titan Ridge controller, 
which has the same Thunderbolt 3 protocol or Thunderbolt 3 speeds, display 1.4, but more importantly, it also has that fallback to that USB-C option. I did do a test with this and the functionality on my iPad Air Gen 4 uh, that has USB-C, it's recognized and it does work. Now, at the end of the day, when it comes down to how fast the, you know, these benchmarks are and all of these numbers, it really comes down to the programs themselves. So how fast that program is going to read and write, regardless of the synthetic benchmarks, and yes, I did run some synthetic benchmarks, so let's get into it. Now, when it comes to these results, I did a couple of comparisons because I have the Thunderbolt 3 enclosure from Fledging and the USB 4 from Acasis. I also have the Western Digital SN750 at one terabyte and the Silicon Power, which is a Gen 4 chip, but also one terabyte. So the Western Digital SN750 in the Thunderbolt 3 enclosure Blackmagic uh, read and write was about 2501 and 2476. Now AJA was 2653 and 1780, whereas the Crystal Disk 2868 and 1577. It's interesting some of these numbers that you get because I do see people throwing around just the Blackmagic speed test and they're like, oh, this is, I'm getting the throughput, getting the saturation that I'm supposed to get. Now, not to get all my soapbox too high here. Now, the USB 4 enclosure using the SN750, Blackmagic read and write was 2746 and 2570, whereas the AJA 2926, 1785, and Crystal Disk 3118 and 1126. Now, Silicon Power, bouncing over uh, to Silicon Power in the USB 4 enclosure, because I've already tested it in the fledging, but Blackmagic read and write is 2764 and 2653. And of course, AJA 2871 and 1880. Now Crystal Disk is 3052 and 1026. Now, of course, when it comes to the benchmarks, I don't wanna to get too far up on the, on the soapbox here. I get it that it's trying to push the thermals, all that throughput, saturate it, and then also fill the cache. I understand it's a place to begin I'm just more about what we're doing with the actual enclosure. So transfer speeds were interesting. So transfer of 150 uh, gigs of data from the extreme SSD, and I will link that up. So that is not a, a USB 4 or Thunderbolt 3. Um, to the Thunderbolt 3 fledging and the SN750, that took about three minutes and 58 seconds. Now the transfer of the same files from the, ex the extreme SSD to the USB 4, SN750, that took about four minutes and three seconds, but really there were an extra, I think three gigs of data in there. So about the same. Now transfer of that same file from the Thunderbolt 3 enclosure to USB 4 took two minutes and 28 seconds. And now I always refer to video editing when it comes to these tests, because it's the world that I live in. It is a real world use case. It pushes the enclosure, it pushes the computer. And so I have, a full 4K timeline with four 4K ca camera clips, three audio tracks with corrections, transitions, texts, LUTs, and a set of Ginsu knives to just throw it in there. Now, this is a 16 minute timeline. It's based off of a, a video that I just did. And of course, when we talk about um, the original media, there were there's no render, all of the render files are gone. It was just exporting and I did an export to a compressed 4K H.264, compressed for YouTube. And the reason why I did that is that when I upload my videos to YouTube, it only takes like a couple minutes for it to process into 4K. So this is a compression that I use that does take a little bit more time. Now, the export time on that 4K timeline with the Thunderbolt 3 enclosure and the SN750, 31 minutes, 23 seconds and that export time with the USB 4 enclosure and the SN750, 31 minutes and 22 seconds. And the export time with the USB 4 enclosure and the silicon power, 31 minutes and 25 seconds. And just for kicks, the export time with the Extreme SSD was actually 31 minutes and 50 seconds, and it's not Thunderbolt or USB 4. And of course, something else that I threw in here that if you're interested and you're like, well, why don't you just edit on the internal? I did, 31 minutes, 23 seconds, because 
This again, it's a compressed H.264 4K. This is the workflow. This was not just rendering or rather exporting in a 422 much larger file much quicker. And of course, the GPU is really hovering at about 50 to 55 percent. So that wasn't fully maxed out. The CPU certainly wasn't fully maxed out on that. But we were trying to get that saturation. And you've got to understand whether Thunderbolt 3, Thunderbolt 4, USB 4, whatever you want to call it, it's going to come down to how that's going to read and write to the program. So I have plenty of you who have kind of thrown this out about this benchmark and this and that. It's like, OK but how is it actually working for you in your workflow? Now, something that I needed to share with you and mention about the Acasis enclosure is that there was an apparent quality control issue where the, the nut that is on the board that helps secure the SSD to it, well, it was missing. Now, I did reach out because I paid for this, my own money on Amazon. So I reached out to the seller and they had come back and said that they figured out that it was a definitely a quality assurance issue, quality control issue. Uh, they figured it out. And at first they were just gonna kind of give me a workaround. But then after further communication with them, I will give it to them, good customer service, that they said that they have removed those boards, those enclosures from Amazon, and they are redoing them and shipping them to Amazon. So I just wanted to give you a heads up because I stand by the products that I recommend and that I test. So for some of you, you might be fine with a workaround. However, uh, the, the retailer has removed them, is trying to remedy the situation. They are supposed to send me not, I'm, it, I paid for it. I didn't ask for a refund. They're not refunding me the money. I just want the enclosure that works. I can update you to make sure that everything is a go. But what I did see is on Amazon that the shipping dates have moved well into like March, mid-March, and maybe even touching April. So if you're interested in this particular enclosure, it might take a little bit of time because they have to send everything to Amazon. So at the end of the day, though, I can accept these results right now because the massive gain in performance that I'm getting from the CPU and the GPU that 4K timeline that, that's laid out in the original media, not proxy, it's just, it's not struggling on the M1 as it does on my Intel machine. I'll accept that based on the long-term results that I've gotten. But what I wanna do is ask you for any questions or comments or anything that you want to know or provide to me. Because again, as I said, I'm just one man just trying to do this all to help you make that buying decision. So. Go out there and do those things that matter. Hit me up on Twitter or YouTube. These are the best places to find me. So you go do the things, keep rocking the faces. I will keep creating more content and value for you here. And until next time, I'll catch you right back here on the next one.